Hello once again folks and very welcome along to another video from Gundog and Fly um, Tamila Fly to Roiv Now today um, Today is going to be sort of a two part video if you like I'm going to attempt to answer a very important question that I've been asked and then I'm going to get into the tying um, Been a great response to the beginners fly tying uh, serious the the first or maybe I think it's the second I'm not sure but um, great response and an awful lot of positive positivity and um, some great questions and one of the questions I was asked was why would a fish in River A take any fly virtually just cast over him as opposed to the fish in River B who's very choosy and uh, much more difficult to catch. Now this is one of the things I think that are it's it's critical to have a basic understanding of why this happens in order to be somewhat successful fly fishing. Now I fish primarily the river shore here in Ireland which is a world-renowned trout stream and it has a huge variety of insect life and because of that huge variety of insect life, the fish in that river can afford to be choosy. They can choose the insects they like and they can ignore the rest because there's such an abundance of insects in the river. So they become choosy and as a consequence, if you don't have a basic understanding of the flies that they're choosing at a given time, well then you're likely to fail and, and basically you may have a modicum of success chucking and chancing it but you need to have an understanding if you want to be um, successful you need to have a very basic understanding of the insect life that doesn't mean that you have to be an expert by any measure all you need to do is have a very basic understanding now the other river where the trout will take virtually anything the reason that is is because it's what I would call a hungry river. It doesn't have a huge abundance of insect life so therefore the fish in that river doesn't have a whole lot of choice and because it's relati relatively scarce they have to take virtually anything that comes along because they may have to wait quite a while for something else to come along. So your chances of catching the fish in that river are way above the other river unless you have an understanding of how the whole thing works. So we'll say, just take for example a mountain stream where the insect life is scarce. The fish is there, he sees just for example an insect every 5-10 minutes and like he has to take advantage of that so he grabs anything virtually that comes along. So if you cast your fly out to him he's, much, he's very likely to take it and you can have success in a river like that. You go to a river like the shore and you see a trout rising for example and if you don't understand or, or have some idea what the, fi what the fish is doing he may have selected just for example he might be taking blue wing olives now there could be plenty of other insects coming along because that's the nature of the river but he has chosen to take the blue wing olives and if you don't identify that well then you can throw flies at him all day and you likely put him down or he'll just completely ignore them because he has selected the blooming olive and if you don't have a good representation of that he's going to just ignore it so I, I, I hope that answers that question it's a very important question it's one of the fundamentals of fly fishing is that you have a basic understanding of entomology that doesn't mean you have to be an expert and be able to identify um, a particular insect in a particular part of its life cycle you don't need to be an expert you just need to have a layman's understanding of it also what can happen on a river like the shore is the fish be can become super selective to the point where they choose to take flies but only during a particular period of its life cycle flies go through different uh, stages in their life cycle and the, the trout and I've seen this many times they can choose to take the fly but only during a particular part of its life cycle and again if you don't understand that or, or, or you're not able to identify that well then you're likely to fail so I hope that's answered the question I can't remember who asked the question but it's a very important and a vital question 
So, um, I can't think of any of the other questions right off the top of my head at the moment. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to delve into just one, well, two particular aspects of tying flies, bodies and tails. So, let's get to it. Now, I'm going to start out with um, bodies. Now, I'm going to attempt to give you an overall idea of what comprises the body of a fly. <coughs> now, <coughs> this won't be an exhaustive list because you can use potentially any material to make the body of a fly, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the commonest um, materials used to make the bodies on flies and like I said there are a myriad of products out there and a lot of the time you can innovate and sort of make up your own bodies but I'll try to give you the best idea I can. Um, I'm just going to use a random hook here I'm just going to use a mustad dry fly hook it's a size 12 not that that's uh, important at the moment so I'm just going to put the fly or the hook in the vise here. Now down through the years like I say many different materials have been used to tie the body of a fly probably the simplest of all is just your tying thread or tying silk and basically all it means is a wrap of tying silk the full length or whatever of the body and there you are there's the simplest form of a fly body just that now it doesn't get much simpler than that okay that's one example now like I said there are a myriad of products this is one of them uh, this is called straggle string and basically what it is this is a little rope but what it has in it it has um, reflective material which makes for a nice body so again just tie that in there and wind it on and you can see that's creating a little body with all that reflective material in it and a kind of a boggy leggy appearance so there you go that's two bodies in no time whatsoever <coughs> now I'm going to dismantle this one it's much easier to tie it on than it is to take it off anyway Tell you what, I put in a new hook. Now, right. Yeah. Of course, <coughs> we have the great advantage now that there's so many different materials that are quite easily available. again I'm going to use a couple of other materials here so I'm putting down the tying thread as a base for a body this time now that's a heron's feather I found it on the bank of the river and I'm just going to clip out a little piece here now I'm going to make the body from this just a little slip of um, heron hurl but of course it's quite delicate so you need to reinforce that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this wire here to reinforce it and it will also create a rib a segmented effect if you like so tie in the wire first and then my heron hurl and you tie in of course it's tapered uh, this is the thin end and it, gra it gets gradually just 
a very small bit, but it, of course it's it, it, it's noticeable. Um, it gets thicker as it goes back along. So again, tie in. And like I said in the last video, always stay well back from the eye. Now I'm going to wrap that hair and hurl. Hair and hurl is used in quite a few famous flies. Now I'm just going to tie that in. Trim the waist. Now, and the wire rib, because I put the hurl on in that rotation, I'm going to put the wire rib in the direction opposite, the opposite rotation, in open turns. This, because I brought it in the direction opposite, that will reinforce the hurl hurl and make it virtually indestructible. Now, so that's a feather fiber body and it's ribbed with, in this case, it's a golden olive wire. Um, so there you go, that's two types of body so far. Um, I'll strip them down later on and recover those hooks, because most of that hooks are not cheap. Right, now we go again. Now, like I said, you can use anything that virtually comes to mind. Uh, that's two. Yes, I have two more that I'm going to show you. Now, one of the more common um, things used to tie flies down through the years has been her or, um, peacock hurl, stripped peacock hurl. But it's a pain in the arse to strip the peacock hurl and it's very delicate now you can buy them already stripped somebody will have them stripped for you and um, I, I, I was never a big fan of it it's very delicate very easy break and it tends to be get mashed up really badly by the the teeth of trout so I'm not a fan of I'm gonna of course I'm gonna get someone on here says now you can't really tie such a fly unless you use um peacock hurl but I, I'm just not a fan of it. When I want to tie quills, I use this stuff here. It's a um, body quill, and I think it's made by Hens, H-E-N-D-S, and it comes in a huge variety of colors, and I find this stuff really good. Basically what it is, it's just like, a, it's just like plastic, but it creates a beautiful effect on the bodies of all types of flies. Um, just show you here how it, now, the colour of the the tying thread you use is important here because it can um, it can have an effect on the colour of the body. It can come through if you like, depending on the colour of the body quills that you're using. It can show through, and that can be advantageous at times, uh, or but you may not want it either. Anyway, to show you how this stuff what it looks like. It gives a nice kind of glistening, juicy effect to the body of a fly. Now this is orange, I think, this color. Um, I like this stuff. Uh, I've been tying a lot of flies with this stuff and um, it's been, they've been really successful. So there you go. That's another body for you. Just really nice, I really like that stuff. Anyway, okay, that's one more. Ah, hang on, am I going to get away with it? Yes, very good. All right, now, again, I'm just using the same tine thread all the time, just, you can vary that color also as well. Right, I'm just gonna create a base here. Now, where is it? Um, this is basically uh, a grizzle hackle, and hold on, there's one I've already prepared. What I've done is I've just taken off the feather fiber, 
and what I'm going to use for the body is the stem of the feather if you like the center of the feather and it creates a nice ribbed effect and as well as that it's a bit more durable than peacock harrow so I'm just going to put it up along there and again you can touching turns oh yes I have and um, one more after this one that I almost neglected to mention and of course needless to say one of the most important so there you go there's another body for you uh, simple enough too you can reinforce it if you want with a little bit of varnish or you can rib it with the tie and thread or rib it with wire whatever you want to do okay now I'm going to show you the final one and okay this is a huge area this is one of the boxes of one of my boxes of Dublin there's another box of Dublin I mean I use a lot of Dublin for tying flies I find Dublin very very good um, like I said before I make a lot of this stuff myself well, when, I, when I say I make it I mix various different things together to get different colors and different effects and uh, I have boxes and boxes and loads of boxes of it because the, because I tie so many flies I need to have a huge variety of dubbing and I think one of the advantages of dubbing it's a little bit more difficult to use than any of the other methods um, it takes some time to learn how to to dub um, dubbing material onto the thread it's um, it's something that uh, takes a little while to learn but um, be sure to do it I'm going to use just this color here just to use it as an example now different materials will have differing levels of difficulty in applying it to the thread some th some of the stuff is easier to apply to the thread than others but one of the secrets with dubbing is to use very little at a time I offer it up to the thread and what I do then between my thumb and my index finger I wind it in one direction only I'm winding it like that and it adheres to the thread it's essentially wrapped around the thread but I'm only moving in one direction sometimes you see beginners they wind it on and then they wind it off at the same time it's a mistake that I see all the time so just one direction only and then you can wrap your body on like that and again if you wanted to rib it with wire or whatever the case may be but dubbing has of all things that I use to for the bodies of flies dubbing is my favorite um, I get the color and the variety or uh, the the effect I want from it and what I find as well is the more it's fished and it becomes straggly and raggedy that's when it becomes even more effective why you'd probably have to ask a trout but anyway they they're, they're some of the bodies that I use now there are others besides that but those are the ones that uh, I use most commonly and of all of them I would choose dubbing over all the rest even though all the rest of them have their place as well so that's the bodies lads um, again any questions on that jump into the comment section and uh, I'll endeavor to answer it best I can so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to tails now tails on a fly um, is it necessary to put a tail on a fly well it is and it isn't and um, for wet flies and nymphs I'm not sure that it's really necessary to have a tail on a wet fly or a nymph it doesn't seem to make any real difference in using the fly I've used say if, just for example a pheasant tail nymph which is one of the best nymphs of all times probably caught more fish than anything else the pheasant tail nymph I've tied it using it with tails and without tails and I've had tails eaten off and broken off for various reasons and it made no difference whatsoever to the trout that's my experience 
Well, same with wet flies. Um, a lot of wet flies are tied and there's tails on them. And again, the same experience, I've tied them with the tail and tried them without the tail and they've worked equally as good as each other. So go figure. Anyway, but tails are important when it comes to a dry fly. Two things, first of all, because of the nature of a dry fly, it floats on the surface of the water and the tail gives it a level of stability and balance that you would not otherwise get. You wouldn't get the same um, balance or um, stability with a dry fly without a tail. So it's important from that point of view. And also, as I spoke about earlier, I've, the selectivity of fish on rivers like the shore when they become really, really selective. Um, there's a particular period of a fly's life cycle. Um, it's called the emerging period for those who don't know. And it's when the fly is emerging from um, being from its nymphal form into an adult form. It's that intermediate period. And it's known at that point as an emerger. It's emerging from the water into the air, basically. And when it does that, uh, it, it pulls itself out of its exoskeleton, as it's known as shuck. Its skeleton is on the outside as opposed to um, <laughs> Animals like ourselves who have our skeleton on the inside, they have their skeleton on the outside and they break that skeleton, they climb out of it. But sometimes that skeleton hangs on and then it's known as a shuck, a trailing shuck. And I've seen the trout deliberately select those flies as opposed to flies without the trailing shuck. So from that point of view, it's important to be able to replicate that. So I'm going to just show you um, a couple of tails. Um, the more common um, hackle fibre tail and then I'm going to show you the trailing shuck which isn't a really a tail as such but um, you'll see what I mean as I go along. Anyway I'm going to just use hackle fibres here this is a grizzle hackle uh, quite long as you can see and I just pull out uh, by the way these are at an angle to the stem so if you pull them off just like that, what will happen is you'll get um, you get a staggered tail. The tail won't be level. So what what I do is I pull them out until they're at right angles to the stem, and then I don't pull the t the tail off. I pull that away, and that gives you a level tail. If you like, all the ends are nice and neatly level as opposed to being staggered all over the place. Now maybe that might make a whole pile of difference but at the same time if you want your flies to look nice as well put everything in proportion and get everything um, nicely level. Now the length of the tail I always use a tail the same length as the body of the fly. Now it's, a pro it's an approximation but it's a, a good way to get a good balanced fly. So I'm, I'm measuring it here with my right hand and then I'm going to catch it here with my left hand. Now the piece between my index finger and my thumb is the right length. So now I just drop the tread over a couple of turns and there's your tail. Right? That simple. Now, there are many effects you can create with tails as well. You have splayed tails and split tails and all the rest of it, right? So I'm just going to show you one of those. If you want to get a splayed tail, if you want to get it splayed out, I'll show you one simple way of doing that. So I'm going to unwind it here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to wind the thread on until I create a small little lump, just a small one. You'll see it here. And then what I do is I tie my tail on just in front of that bump and what that will do is it will have the effect of splaying the tail out like that so as opposed to being just uh, one direct tail you now have a splayed tail which gives you great balance and great floatability on a dry fly so that's just two ways of um, creating a tail with just hackle fibers now I'm going to go with the trailing shock, which is, um, I suppose, not really. It's a, t it's a tail in the sense that it's, um, 
at the rear of the fly but it's it's not a tail in reality it's it's the exoskeleton of the fly hanging on or stuck on for some reason and um, there are many materials you can use to replicate it but I principally use Antron and here we have it in very a variety of different colors uh, that's um, steel gray burnt orange uh, fluorescent pink now fluorescent pink really are mostly used for winging but you get the idea and there's just a bit of gray Antron and if you don't want to buy it in rolls like this which is very convenient for people like me who tie a lot of flies carpet is mostly made from Antron that's where I got this it was an old carpet and I just pulled this bit out of it and um, basically it's just a sort of a crinkly fiber and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to tie down this can be used for making wings as well but for the moment we're talking about the trailing shuck and again the trailing shuck should be approximately the length of the body now that's a little bit heavy so I'm going to thin it out there we go I just pulled out a few fibers and that's your trailing shuck tail that simple now there are many many ways of using and tying tails I've used paintbrush fibers if you get uh, nice tapered if you want to be very specific about it and um, you can get things called micro fibbits which are for making tails as well but effectively all they are is paintbrush fibers you can get a paintbrush then that has nice tapered um, what would you call it I don't know what you'd call it but anyway they work for tails as well so that's it folks that's um, the tailing and the bodies and uh, again like any questions or queries or suggestions pop it jump into the uh, comment section and let me know so that's it folks that was a sort of a, a rudimentary introduction to the bodies and wings of flies it wasn't an exhaustive list by any measure there are virtually a million different things you can use to create bodies and and uh, tails on flies as I said bodies and wings did I, I know. it's bodies and tails um, so um, if I've overlooked anything or if I've missed out on anything or you saw any mistakes that I made jump into the comment section and let me know please or if you have any f suggestions on uh, what you'd like me to do or any further questions I, I like the questions I like to try and answer the questions so that's it for me for this round and um, Please, uh, if you're not already a subscriber, consider subscribing and like the video. And um, if you like what I do and you'd like to support the channel, um, I have a Patreon link in the description where any little bit of support would be appreciated. So, shin shin, be me a kind to live and kedor ele, idrangalin, bigi slain.